And hello, all of you Mid-American Gardeners. We're happy to be here and we're glad that you're watching because we're gonna talk about very timely information on this show. Hi, I'm Diane Noland and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. So my area of expertise is cut flowers and landscape plants, mostly perennials. However, it is Ladies Gardening Day today <laughs> and so I do have two really sharp ladies here uh, with me as well, and we're gonna have them introduce themselves and tell their specialty areas, and so direct your questions that way. I'm gonna start first with Teresa Mears. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Diane. As she said, I'm Teresa Mears, and I teach out at Parkland College in the horticulture department, um, and I also manage the greenhouse at Parkland, so indoor plants, general gardening questions, a little turf, a little insects, a little pruning. That's kind of where I can hit it. Sounds good. And kind of on the vegetable line, I have a question from a grower um, trying to get a new bed of asparagus established. It's taken about two months for it to come up, and is he wondering if the cold has weakened the plant? And this is from Steve. Well, my first thoughts are you probably planted it too deep and it struggled coming up. Asparagus is one of those really fun plants where if you dig a trench about eight to 10 inches deep, Plant your asparagus at the bottom of the trench and allow it to grow. And when it's up about two inches, cover it back up. And you keep doing this all the way until you reach the surface, rather than digging the trench, burying it, and putting it down eight or 10 inches like you would a bulb. But allow it to come, and dahlias actually are another plant that works really well this way too, because it gives them a much deeper base and supports the big flower heads. I've heard that with gladiolas mm -hmm. as well. Gladiolas. So, but you can't bury it eight or 10 inches to start off because it takes forever for it to come up like you're seeing. Now, once it does come up, you wanna give it two years before you do any harvesting. Like two full seasons to grow, the third year you can start harvesting. Otherwise, you just weaken the plant too much. I've always heard them say, let it be pencil thick mm -hmm. <laughs> and no less, but usually more. Yeah. And you should really cut below the ground. You should stick your knife actually into the soil and cut below soil line when you harvest. And it takes a while to get a good asparagus mm -hmm. patch going. So mm -hmm. They like a lot of manure too. So if you've got access to sheep manure or, or horse manure or cow manure, they really like it. And usually when it's dormant. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it depends, but mm -hmm. so it's, it's a patience game, but once you have it, they last for a long time. Oh, yeah. We have some of my husband's Grandpa Davis's asparagus, and they are probably 35 years old. And they're our best ones, the biggest oh, yeah. asparagus come. And then my other mere 40, <laughs> are, <laughs> I overdid it on asparagus. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Now, let's go right next to me, Gloria Young. Hi, Gloria. I'm Gloria Young from the Vermillion County Master Gardeners, and I won't say I've got any specific thing, I delve in a little bit of everything. Good. Uh, my first question here is a doghouse planter. This lady has a large plastic doghouse that she doesn't want to ruin by poking holes in it, but she wants to make a planter out of it. So how she's going to do that uh, is going to just take a little bit of ingenuity on her part because for one thing, if you leave the lid on, the flowers are going to have to come out the front. You're going to have to have this turned either south or southeast most likely because you're going to get a bunch of heat collected in this doghouse when it's on the west. So I think what I would do is I put it on a hillside a little bit, tip it so that it, it gets a, a, a little bit different view. Your plants can come out the front. Uh, vines like your sweet potato vines, things like that mm -hmm. would work fine. And um, for drainage in the bottom, I put some rocks, a lot of rocks in the bottom first because you don't want to poke holes. So, you know, you, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have to water this. You can't depend on the rain to water it because you got the lid on it. Now, if you've taken the lid off, that might be different, but then it wouldn't look like a doghouse. So that's the way I would do it. It's going to be challenging. It, it would be. But it'll probably be cute. I wonder if she's going to start getting plants that have dog in the name or something. <laughs> I can't think of anything but she dog get a little rubber there. dog and yeah. stick it up. I'll give her my pug. Yeah, so he sits a lot. Very, <laughs> yeah, very interesting. So we enjoy our viewer questions. Okay, 
Now, let's um, do a little Did You Know segment, and then we'll go to the phone lines. Been seeing a lot of dragonflies this year, so mm -hmm. that's that's a good thing. Well, let's go to your questions next, and we're going to start with a question on about weeds from Bob on line one. Hi there, Bob. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I've got some large driveways, and I've sprayed them with Roundup, and I've sprayed them with uh, uh, generic Roundup and Trimex and all that stuff. Uh, I'm trying to find something that'll longevity wise last a while and get rid of all these weeds because I got a couple of a variety of weeds that just come back and come back and come back. Do they die down the first time? Oh yeah. Okay. There, there are some products out there and I know one of the Roundup ones actually says Roundup Extend on it and the, the, there are some products that have some additional chemicals added to give you a longer control and I it's just escaped the top of my head, but there is one I know that supposedly they use like along the railroad tracks in different areas once a year. It's all you have to apply it, and it does good burn down and clean up. Um, you just need to go to a really nice garden center, someplace that would have a higher level of chemicals available, and do some asking, and they can get you set up with the right stuff. But there are things out there that you can use, and even as a homeowner, you could purchase and still use. Okay. Very good question, and thank you for that answer. Now, let's go next to a question about clover, and this is on line two, and this is a caller. Oh, Dick, hi, line two. Hello. Hi. Uh, problem is that, uh, how do I get rid of it? How do you get rid of clover? Okay. Well, clover, creeping charlie, violets, all kind of fall under that same category as one of your more troublesome, harder to get rid of weeds and I'm still a big personal fan of Trimec T-R-I-M-E-C and the key to doing Trimec and getting the most success is spraying not only in the spring but somewhere in the summer and most definitely in the fall and then follow up with another spring spray. The fall spray is the key one that most people don't do. Nothing's going to work immediate. It's going to take three or four sprays over the course of probably two years. But you can get a handle on it. But make sure you do a fall spray because it really weakens the plant when it goes into the winter. The winter helps zap it back and you get much better control. I know with Creeping Charlie it helps when it's in flower. Does it help to spray clover that not, not spring a, and summer? Not as, you, well, I, summer I would do a spring, would. a summer, and a fall. Yeah. But very few people do the fall. Most people do a spring. And you still and would get a little bit of flowering, possibly. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. new growth would come on even in the but fall. But I don't, I've never worried about whether mine are in flower when yeah. I spray. Just and be consistent. Be consistent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. You can tell it's a good growing year. We've got two questions oh. about weeds to start us off. <laughs> All right, let's talk to Jim on line three about white oak trees. Hi there, Jim. Hi, Diane. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome white oak tree and I have a lot of sap coming out of the one side of it. Uh, actually on the other side I have a, a cavity that's been there for a number of years but I'm, on the uh, east side I'll say of this tree I'm getting a lot of moths at night, I'm getting uh, butterflies, sap's coming out to extent actually pooling on the ground. Did you do any pruning or was it damaged in any way on that side? Uh, not recently, at least, let me put it that way. It's an old tree. I mean, it's been there a long time. I have not done any pruning at all. No, ma'am. Boy, I don't know. It almost sounds like an injury. Yeah, um, that's just... Yeah. Or you got insects or something feeding under the bark. That yes, that seen. could be. But usually you get woodpeckers if you got insects, too, that you can actually see them feeding for those. And you don't see any actual holes or anything... Well, I've seen these moths that looks like, and I've seen, looks like it could be a carpenter moth, maybe. I've you know, got an insect book and start looking at that kind of thing. And I don't know if they, in fact, the moths at night, when I, I took a picture of the moths, the flash, and as soon as they flew away, 
actually had uh, sap spurred out in one area. Well, they're feeding on the sap more than anything. I don't think mm -hmm. they're the cause. I see. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, but, boy, I don't know. Um, if there's been no real damage to it, then I don't know if it's worth calling an arborist or getting somebody to look at it. Because it's a, I'm assuming it's a fairly large tree yes, that you is. don't want to lose. It, it might be worth looking into and having somebody maybe do some really careful pruning to remove a bad area or something. You might want to check with with an arborist or yeah. just, you know, relieve your own mind about it because it's a little hard for us to tell just from mm -hmm. the sound of it. So, well, we're not giving you an exact answer, but maybe a resource to go to. Well, thank you very much for your question, Jim. Appreciate it. Let's go on to Kathy next, and she has a tree question as well. This is line four. Hi, Kathy. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I really enjoy your show. Thank you. I have a real pretty ash tree in my backyard. It's mature. It's big. It's my only shade on the west side of the house. And how can I prevent those ash borers from getting to it? Or if they do, how can I get rid of them before it damages my tree? It's my understanding they do have a systemic that is supposed to... Yeah, the Bayer product. Right. To keep, you know, the, tr the tree safe. And... It's better, though, that a professional applies it. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely It's not that. something a homeowner would no. apply. You'd have no. to call an arborist in. Yeah. And it's, um, are you in town? Are there, are you in I'm the I'm in town. We, I, we don't have any of the ash borers yet. I just wondered if there was a preventive measure we could mm -hmm. take or if they do happen to get on the tree, if there's something we could use to get rid of them. The only thing that have proved any really effectiveness has to be done by a professional. Mm -hmm. You have to call an arborist in. Um, there is some stuff you can do as a homeowner that doesn't really amount to anything and it's kind of putting a band-aid on it. Um, the best bet is if there are very few ashes near you because if the ash doesn't, the boar doesn't find anything else to eat on, he flies elsewhere and lands and lays their eggs. So if you're in an isolated spot, you might get lucky and get missed. Um, I had an elm tree in my front yard that had gotten missed wow. when the emerald ash bore, or when the ash disease came through yeah. many years ago. So it's it's possible, but it's more likely what's going on in your neighborhood and um, talking to an arborist about doing anything systemic if they think they're that close, and they would know. They'll know exactly where they're at. Right. And they are close. They oh yeah, are, they're, they're in safe. Champaign. They yeah. are. Yeah. You know, they've been north, and they're central, and then there's some avenues near roadways, mm -hmm. even yeah. farther south. So. And you can watch for them, but the thing is, by the time you find it, they've probably done the, they've done gotten mm -hmm. too far. Yeah. Right. So we're really, um, arborists are going to be busy <laughs> from <laughs> the south. It's that time of year. It though. really is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's switch gears to a Blackberry question, and let's go to line five with Roland. Hi there. Hello. Hi, what's your question? My question is, we have had in the last year or so worms on our blackberries, and we're wondering how we can solve that problem. Now, I've seen Japanese beetles. What do the worms look like? Hi there. Hello. Hi, can you turn your television off? What do we the worms look like? We've had worms on our blackberries. What do they look like? Year or so. And um, we're trying to figure out what we can do to get rid of them. What do they look like? Little white worms. Okay, white. Okay. Well, BT yeah. would yeah. be my first choice. Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a relatively safe product, but you'd still want to wash things very, very closely. But um, it very specific in that it kills caterpillars. It doesn't kill other insects. So BT would be my best guess for this. And you have to be careful when you apply it. So you don't affect the honeybees. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so BT, there's your, there's your answer. Now, we're going to go back to the phone lines in a moment, but let's answer another email question or two. So, Teresa, let's go to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have a tomato question, and they have been using the little Job tomato spikes in the in around their tomato plants. 
and I'm not really sure if they are in a container or if they are in the ground. But she's still getting blossom end rot, which is due to a lack of calcium in your soil on her tomatoes. And she wants to know if the job spikes were enough and most likely not. If you're, if you're getting blossom end rot, you need to have done some bone meal at planting time, maybe even during the season, and some fertilizers that are specific for tomatoes that would have more calcium in it. And unfortunately, during the season, if you're starting to see this problem, it does take some time to recover. You can start adding some calcium-based fertilizers now to help them, but it's going to only affect the tomatoes that develop after the point of application. Mm -hmm. So you'll still see some of this for some time. And it's if you're in a container, get fresh soil. That's your easiest solution. If you're in the ground, it's probably time you did a soil test and took a sample in somewhere and had some readings done to find out what else you have going on. And there's several places in town here that you can do that, I'm sure elsewhere as well. Just call a hold of your extension agent and they can tell you where to go to have a soil test done. Okay. Did you want to well, chime I mean, in on about the tomato plant too? Uh, you, you want to try to keep the moisture levels mm -hmm. as even as you possibly can. If that requires you putting a mulch around to keep the soil moist, because what happens, they're wet one day and dry the next, wet and dry. And, and even if the calcium is present, they can't always absorb it like they need to. And, you know, you kind of want to try to even that out a little bit if mm -hmm. you can. That would help a lot. In fact, when I plant my tomatoes, I mulch. And I don't plant them too early. I wait, but uh, it's really helpful, mm -hmm. even, yeah. even moisture. Okay, now, what is your email okay. question, Okay, my Gloria? email question is about a hardy fig. They purchased it. Uh, it's called a Chicago hardy fig, and it's hardy to zone 5A. Uh, she got on the computer, and there's kind of a, a conflict about how hardy that it is but it should be, and if you plant it on the southeast side, the south side of the residence, it's probably going to be fairly hardy because that is going to do a lot to keep it through the winter months. But um, she wanted to know if she should put it in a pot and move it in the garage. I wouldn't. I just think it's a waste of time. If it says it's hardy, then it probably is hardy. So I would, I would leave it out there and mulch around it and, you know, make it as happy as you can. But siding it properly is going to make the difference. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to do the most for it. Yeah. With grape myrtles, mm -hmm. things that are... And this year we found out what really is not hardy in this area because we had, I think it's called winter. I think that's what it was called. But my crepe myrtle came through great, but it was near a foundation. My red bud had three major branches. I lost two of the three, and now they have since regrown and put shoots out. Mm -hmm. But that's plenty hardy here, so I don't know what it was. It just... It was a hard winter. It was. It, there was everything being thrown at the plants mm -hmm. right. at once, it seemed like. You got that right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to the mag quiz next. <laughs> Well, let's go back to the phone lines and start with LaVon on line one about rhubarb. Hi there, LaVon. Hi. Uh, I have a rhubarb plant that I don't know exactly how old it is. It's been in the ground for quite a while. And I was wanting to know, I, I've heard on your the store before, I mean the show before, that um, you can separate them. And I wanted to know how to separate them. It. And also, when I get the first plant, uh, the first plants that come up, they're really nice size, and now all of them are just like pencil size. And what causes that? For one thing, rhubarb is a heavy feeder. They like to be fed, 
and it makes a big difference in them and of course don't let them go to seed if you see that seed head begin to develop cut it off get rid of it and uh, that might help a lot um, that's the only thing I could think of that would keep make it small. Mm -hmm. Unless it needs to be divided. Yeah. I mean, if it is that tight and that choked, it just may need to divide it. Okay, let's discuss division. When would we, when would you divide it? What would be the best time? I would divide it in the spring when it first begins to grow, when it's got its best growth coming on. Right. Unless it's just doing so poorly now. Right. I suppose you could divide it in the fall. Yeah but I wouldn't do it now. It's supposed to be 60 degrees next week. You could do it. <laughs> well, okay, if it's nice weather, then let But you would want to feed it, and you know, with the heavy feeding, that would keep down on the flower. Yes. Flowering. Right. Flowering, mm -hmm. so I would think some of the flowering might be due to low nitrogen, because it does if you produce If don't want to try dividing it, just start fertilizing it heavier and see what happens. Yeah. You can always divide it again next year if it still thinks it needs it. But if you haven't been fertilizing, it's probably your best bet to start with and your easiest thing to start with. It really is. Mm -hmm. So try that and then go for spring division or any time is going to be cool enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, LaVon. Let's move on to a hydrangea question, and this is on line six with Everett. Hi there. Oh, Diane. Thanks for taking my call. You are welcome. I have a question about hydrangeas. Okay. I have three plants. One of them blooms, the other two don't. This has been going on for years. Are they on the same side of the house? And uh, They're out in the yard. They're about 30 feet apart, the two that don't bloom. And they're all the same type. I'm assuming this is the yes, pinkish purple color. They were pink at first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My wife put something on them, I can't remember what, to try to make them blue. She made them more acidic. They like it more acidic, and so she put some sulfur down. Um, yeah. But that wouldn't stop it from Blooming. No, from they'll flowering. still bloom. Um, they have beautiful foliage, but oh yeah. no, no blooms. In, my sister-in-law has one just like that that she's had problems with. And we're contemplating moving it to the east side, away from the south side. So maybe it's just a location. I know I grow these at Parkland on the north side of the building. And because of the parking lot, there is some heat and stuff, but they bloom like crazy there. So So the buds are getting frosted off, do you think? At his house, probably being out in the open, out where the they're open. not protected. Um, but he's had several years, and we've had mild winters some years. That's true. But we've had drought. And they don't like drought. They and like they do water. Not like that. They like to have their water. Our nickname is Hydroopy, not Hydrangea. <laughs> Hydroopy. <laughs> yes. Um, I've heard all kinds of crazy things where you can actually do some root pruning, not actually move them, but just cut the roots and stress them. Um, I don't. I don't know. It's. And it wouldn't hurt to try. Yeah. But. Okay, Glory, what you got in I've mind? Got, I've got hydrangeas this year that have never bloomed before that are going to bloom. <laughs> After that horrible winter oh, that I was sure would have just killed them flat, it didn't, and they, they are going to bloom. But I would try moving them if you, if you think that may help them out, if they've been hesitant to bloom. And she, Diane was talking about their root business. If you take a, a shovel and shove it down into the soil around the plant, and disturb some of the roots of supposedly that makes the plant think it's going to die and it up and blooms. I know that works with wisterias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that might be something you want to try before you and, move it. And it may flower, but it also will root prune for when you move it later because right. you'll get some smaller fibrous roots. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think in our zone, in our area, sometimes a full south or full sun view is just too much for them. It's too dry usually, it's too harsh on them. Yeah. So if you got an eastern side of the house or somewhere where there's some more protection, a little bit under the trees, mm -hmm. something, I think they're happier. They seem to, mm -hmm. they seem to look it, at gardens where they're going beautifully. They seem to be in that location. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we hope that helps you out, Everett. That hydrangeas can be challenging. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't have too much time left, but there are so many things for gardeners to be doing. Let me put forth the idea of weeding. Uh, what else would you say <laughs> would be a good thing? I've been doing a lot of deadheading. I have too. Because things are coming on mm -hmm. nicely, so I'm trying to keep them coming. 
and stuff. Um, I've been dividing a few uh, pots I've had in the house for a long time mm -hmm. and bringing them out with the cooler weather. And the, the, it's a good time to put down some lawn chemicals because the next week we're supposed to be cool. We've been wet. Things are going to start trying to grow again, especially some of the seed weeds, the annual seeds. Mm -hmm. They're henbit and our creep and our uh, creep all the grass, um, crabgrass. Oh, crabgrass. Crab mm -hmm. They're going to start trying to grow again in this weather, and you're going to see another resurgence. So it's not going to hurt. I've had chives reflowering mm -hmm. after I cut them back. So deadheading is good because it tricks them sometimes yes. into mm -hmm. doing a second bl uh, flush, which coral bells, sometimes other things, dianthus as well. Well, I'll tell you, it goes so fast. I want to thank each of you for watching. Have a great week gardening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.